Morning, S4. How are we doing? Um, I would like to talk to you uh, in this video. This is our second last week, by the way. How good is this, eh? Um, I would like to talk to you in this video about ionic bonding. Uh, two videos back, we looked at something called isotopes and ions. Now, the isotopes bit was maybe a bit weird because it doesn't seem to connect to anything, but don't worry, it will after the holidays. We're going to have a look at radiation. Which and radioactivity, which are connected to isotopes. You just needed to know what they were first. But the ions, uh, can I remind you what an ion was? An ion was an atom which had lost or gained electrons. Why did it do that? Um, it lost or gained electrons to give itself an outside full uh, layer of electrons. In the process, it gets a charge. Slightly counterintuitively, um, if you lose electrons, which are negative, I suppose it makes sense if you think about it, if you lose electrons, you're left with less negatives than positives in the atom. It's now become an ion, of course, uh, and you create a positive ion. That's things like metals. They tend to lose electrons simply because they've got one, two, or three in their outer layers. If you gain electrons, then you will have more negatives than positives in your atom. It's no longer an atom. It's called an ion uh, and it's a negative charge, and that tends to be non-metals. So, uh, in, the in the last video, guys, we looked at covalent molecules. Uh, we looked at the fact that there's, there's two different approaches, basically, to giving yourself a full outer layer of electrons. You can share electrons. Sharing electrons is wonderful, and that's covalent bonds. So that creates covalent compounds, covalent molecules. We looked at the fact there was two different structures. You could have individual little ones, or you have a big, giant, massive network. Very different properties. Have a look back at that video if you need a wee bit of revision. But basically today, we're talking about, she uh, we're talking about ionic compounds and ionic bonding. Um, so we have basically transferred electrons. We have transferred electrons from the metals to the non-metals. So if you, tr if you transferred electrons, then we're talking about ionic compounds. And if you're sharing, it's talking about covalence. I did give you one last hint last time, and I said, generally speaking, um, covalent molecules tend to be, uh, now I'm using weasel words here, aren't I? Tend to be, and usually, um, they tend to be two non-metals bonded together. Um, these tend to be a metal and a non-metal bonded together. How do you know whether an element is a metal or a non-metal, by the way? Um, the answer is, you look on the periodic table, you'll find that zigzag line. Everything on the left is a metal, everything on the right is a non-metal. That's how you know. Before we leave today, though, you're going to have a better test. This is a rough guide, but you're going to have a, better, a much better test. Now, if we were in class, which we will be hopefully once we go back in August, if we were in class, I'd have some great models of ionic compounds. Instead, I've got these funky pictures that I printed out. Um, now, this is a sodium chloride. Just in case you forget, of course, sodium is a metal. People will tend to forget that um, because it's on the left-hand side of the zigzag line. This is a non-metal. And this is... this weird thing here is actually, hold on two seconds, I'll go and get one. Now this, don't know if it will focus or not, come on, find the grain of salt camera, find it, it's there, find it. <sighs> okay, we're going to have to go with that. This actually looks like this on the microscopic scale, believe it or not. And I'm hoping to have a reasonably fun experiment to finish off this video, uh, finish off this assignment for you. I'll leave this grain of salt here. So, um, this is sodium chloride, guys, and it's made of sodium ions and chloride ions. The sodium is actually the smaller one here. The chloride is the larger one. They all stick together in a big massive dollop like that. We want a better term than massive dollop. So what we're going to call it is a lattice. So, ionic compounds form 
ionic lattices, very different to the molecule stuff. A lattice, by the way, is a term in geometry for just a repeating geometric pattern. Um, and these are chloride ions, Cl negative, and these are sodium ions. I'm desperately hoping you don't need to, me to tell you why they all go chunk together in a big uh, pattern like this. However, if you don't quite get it, our grain of salt is hell. Oops. Our gra <laughs> yeah, I'll just doodle on the grain of salt. Uh, okay, our grain of blue salt now, because I managed to touch it with the tip of the pen. Our grain of salt is held together by the fact that these are positive, these are negative, so you get an electrostatic attraction. So the same thing that makes your hair stick to the balloons uh, when you rub it against it is exactly what's holding this grain of salt together and stopping it from going and exploding out as a cloud of separate ions. Fortunately, that doesn't happen, so you can put it on your chips. Um, and that's the forces that actually cause this. So there's electrostatic forces. How strong are they? They're pretty tough. They are pretty tough. Otherwise, this bad boy here, this grain of salt, would be a liquid or a gas at room temperature. There's not enough energy in this room to break these forces of attraction. You can do it. And hopefully, once we're back in the lab, we will do it. It's a, an experiment I regularly do with my National Fives. We melt salt. You have molten salt in a test tube. It's quite cool. Uh, not dissolve it, melt it. It looks for all the world like glowing orange water, except it melts about 700 Celsius, so it's uh, a liquid at about 800 Celsius. Pretty dangerous stuff, but good fun to do. Um, so ionic lattices, guys, from ionic compounds, which are usually made of uh, a metal and a non-metal put together. Very, very different to the old molecules, you know, overlapping, sharing electrons that we had last time. If you need a revision, then go back and look at the last video, please. <coughs> um, the last thing I want to do before we finish. So I wanted to do a couple of things. I wanted to introduce ionic compounds. I wanted to show you what their structure is like, this lattice pattern. And lastly, I wanted to show you what their properties are, the physical properties when compared to covalence. So can we draw ourselves a quick comparison table, I wonder? I might edit this so you don't get bored watching me draw a table. Right guys, save you the boredom watching me draw this. This is going to be an overall bonding properties. I, I called it ionic compound properties because we're looking mainly at ionics today, but I thought I'd just throw in a couple of other wild cards so we can compare. We can mix and match across the board here. Let's go with blue. Um, ionics are full of positive and negative charges. Go back to this for a second. Every blob here is oppositely charged and they're all electrically charged. So the question is, do they conduct electricity? And here's the proper test. Here's the absolute fail-safe test for ionic compounds. Do they conduct electricity? Not when solid, but they do when dissolved or melted. So if you put salt in the water, it suddenly conducts way better than normal water. We'll come back to water actually later on because it's weird stuff. What about melting and boiling points? Well, I said the attractions are quite high and salt, the last time I checked, is a solid at room temperature. So they are, generally speaking, quite high. Physical state. This means they tend to be solid at room temperature anyway. Solubility. Many dissolve in water. The SQA want you to know that, although dissolving is a bit of witchcraft, so many uh, dissolve in water. Um, a very quick uh, recap on these guys here. Covalent molecules never conducted. In fact, I'm tempted to say uh, I, was, I should have written right across these boxes because covalents never conduct at all. They don't have any charges in them. They don't have positive and negative ions in them. Uh, melting and boiling points, you remember the molecules tended to be low and the covalent networks were very high. Um, these tend to be gases or liquids because of this. These tend to be solids. In fact, they just are solids. Um, solubility, these never dissolve. You can't dissolve diamond or sand in water. We talked about this last time. Covalent molecules, uh, it's a wee bit of a... Usually not. But we'll come back to that in more detail later on. Which leaves um, this wild card at the end here. 
why am I talking about metals? Aren't we finished with them? Not really. That's why I wanted to do metals before we went on to National 5 stuff, guys. Uh, conduct electricity? Always. That's the giveaway for metals. And that is the giveaway for ionic compounds. And of course, that is the giveaway for covalence. So it turns out that's a much better test than saying metal, non-metal, two non-metals. It's a rough guide, but this is your proper test. Um, melting boiling points of metals, why not finish this? Yeah, they're high usually, although they're quite weird metals, they cover a huge range. Look at mercury, the liquid at room temperature, but generally speaking, they tend to be quite high. Physical states, yeah, most of them are solid. Solubilities, never. They don't dissolve in water. They might react with it, but that's group ones. And that is us done. So today, folks, I wanted to introduce ionic compounds to you. Uh, a very quick recap on that. What was an ion? An ion was an atom which lost or gained electrons. Um, why did it do that? For the same reason as these guys shared ele electrons, to try and make the outer layer full up. So it's just a different way of achieving an outer layer. It's a very different way to this. So you transfer electrons instead of sharing them. Um, ionic compounds, because they're charged, oppositely charged, once you form these ions, they all stick together in a big lattice. You can break apart that lattice when you dissolve it. In fact, I've got one last nice picture for you. What we got here on the right is just a glass of water. These are wee water molecules. What we've got on the left is my grain of salt busy dissolving in the water. Most of it's still in a chunk there, but if you have a look, you'll see the wee purple ions are breaking off and being surrounded by water molecules. That's what happens on your tongue. And it's these that trigger the sensation of saltiness on your tongue. And the last thing I wanted to do is go back to my master sheet comparing um, the four different types uh, that you're required to know about for National 5, guys, and their overall properties. Feel free to make some notes from this if you want. Other than that, next week will be the last week of term. I'm going to figure out something for us to do next week, hopefully. I did say an experiment. I might, I'll, I could set you up an experiment over the holidays, couldn't I? Or I might put it in the assignment at the end of this video. I'll wait and see. Thanks for listening to my ramblings, folks. Bye-bye.